Oh, hi starting? there. Welcome <laughs> to... <laughs> you got to give me my moment, Sheldon. My moment of introduction. It's the one, like, classy thing where I'm like, hi, everybody. <laughs> my bad. My bad. Right, you drink instead. Uh, welcome to Liberty.me. I am Lucy Steigerwald. Um, this is Free Association. And the, you know, the guy who... Why we're here is Sheldon. Richmond, you know, from lots of fine writings for Reason and Center for Stateless Society and previously to Freeman and Freedom Daily and, like, lots of good stuff. And you know this. You know this. But I'll tell you anyway because I have some sort of weird, like, tick where I have to be organized at the start of my podcasts because they always go awry. And what, Sheldon, my dear fellow, are we talking about today? We were going to kick the kick around the idea of uh, decentralization versus uh, centralization, uh, with emphasis on the the world we actually live in, rather than talking about ideals. Although we can talk about ideals too, but I think we should also realize that we are working in the and living in the midst of a situation, right? That we're mm -hmm. in. We can't leap out of it. So the question is, what do we do? What do we do now? What do we do now? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. Let's go have dinner. Uh, no, that won't help. <laughs> Me too. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start by mentioning an article. I put the link there in the uh, also in the chat area. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll do it again. This is an article that Roderick Long wrote at the Mises Institute uh, a few years ago, right after the uh, Supreme Court's Kelo decision. So the Kelo decision is a famous eminent domain case where the town of uh, New London, Connecticut was taking uh, not just Suzette Kilo's home, but a whole bunch of homes in, in the neighborhood, uh, the section of the town, I think, called Trumbull, I think it is called, uh, but not to do the traditional things government has done with land taken by eminent domain, uh, but rather to hand it over to a private uh, uh, developer. Uh, Pfizer, I know Pfizer ph 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 Pharmaceuticals was involved in this, but I, I don't know if they were actually going to be the direct recipient. But anyway, it's a private developer, developer that was putting in an industrial park and uh, various things, including a Pfizer uh, laboratory or factory. And uh, the city thought this was a great idea because it was going to raise more revenue than these homes raised, you know, through the property tax. So they thought, okay, that's a public use. That makes it a public use. So well, the, quote, the public... N namely the government wasn't going to use the land it was going to get the revenues from it so they thought they could stretch it and this uh, appalled a lot of people uh, it's not the first time such a thing happened actually because in Detroit in Pole Town a a, 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 an ethnic section of Detroit back in, the in 1980 the state of Michigan seized a whole neighborhood including homes and shops and churches to give to General Motors for a Cadillac factory uh, so it wasn't the first time, and they and they 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 got away with it. I don't know if it went to the Supreme Court. They got they certainly got away with it at the state level. Anyway, this was this outraged people, even people who uh, believe in eminent domain, which I don't believe in, and no libertarian should believe in, because it wasn't a road or a post office or a you know a military base, which is was the original kind of meaning of public use. It, it, I guess it related somewhat to public goods. But it was something the government was actually going to use, quote, for the service of the public. Uh, it, it didn't seem to include giving it to a private company because that business would generate more tax revenue for the local jurisdiction than uh, the, a private home would. So it goes up to the Supreme Court. Uh, this was an Institute for Justice case, by the way. Uh, you, know, you should all be familiar with the Institute for Justice, a great organization that actually fights these micro battles on behalf of people who are abused by the state. Uh, and the the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the city of New London, which I think maybe surprised a lot of people. Uh, so there then arose among libertarians a discussion of whether the Supreme Court decision was a good thing or not. Uh, now you would say, well, how could how could it be a bad thing for a libertarian? I mean, how, sorry, how how could it be a good thing for a libertarian? I get confused which way they found. Let's re let's remember, and by the way, as a side, as a little sidelight here, Donald Trump said he backed the decision 100 percent. 
And let's recall the decision was the city could take the woman's and the other people's homes to give to Pfizer and this private developer because it was in the public interest that there be more a better gen revenue generating uh, use for that land than was currently used. So Donald Trump, quote, 100% behind <laughs> behind it. We know he likes eminent domain. He's, he himself was yep. profited by eminent domain. Anyway, why would libertarians debate this? Why wouldn't they universally say bad decision? Because it sided with the government against these property owners. Well, you may already know the answer to that. There, there, there is a school of thought among libertarians who think that the federal court should, in the name of decentralization, should not be allowed or should not strike down local and state uh, even even local state uh, laws or actions, even when they violate liberty, on the grounds that decentralization is better than centralization, even if in a given case you're going to get a bad decision. So, so Roderick's article, and I really recommend everybody read this if you're interested in this topic at all, has a very interesting discussion about the take on that, and it's a little it comes out being ambiguous. I mean, you, it's not an e it's not an easy topic. You'll see. Uh, so, and and I. I find it, it was very close to my own thinking, I, although I had not put it so systematically. I mean, I applauded, I'm sorry, I opposed the ruling by the Supreme Court. But I was also sympathetic to the idea that decentralization tends to be better, you know, better than centralization, if for no other reason than this. Voting with your feet is less expensive, the smaller the jurisdiction, right? It's harder to leave the country than it is to leave your county and move to the next county or town. Or even state. It gets a little tougher when it's the state. But the bigger the jurisdiction, the more expensive it is to vote with your feet. And the threat that people will vote for their, with their feet, even in today's context, does exercise some constraint on, on, on governments. Uh, I know that's hard to see sometimes given what some states do, like California and New York. They're, they put pretty onerous uh, burdens on um, people that want to start a business. The taxes are high. But imagine if there was no, there were no states at all, and it was just the unitary United States, which is what the opponents of the Constitution felt it was heading toward anyway. It would be even worse. At least there is some competition among jurisdictions, which maybe puts some lid, we, even even though it's hard to see, some lid on the tax level and on the regulatory the, re, the level of regulation. Uh, uh, so. In the end, uh, uh, Roderick says, and I agree with him, that while central decentralization is better than centralization, in today's context, if the if the the federal courts were to say we're never going to strike down uh, uh, state and and local uh, laws that violate liberty, or any state and local laws, whether they violate liberty or not, uh, the the outcome wouldn't be unambiguously good for you know liberty. Because the state and local governments are very good at violating liberty when they want to. So I don't know if I've said enough to kind of get a conversation going. Uh, I know this sounds a little bit muddy because on the one hand decentralization <laughs> is good. On the other hand, when uh, when the federal government, ha I mean the federal courts have struck down bad laws in the past. Look, we can go back to 1905 when they struck in the Lochner, the famous Lochner case. Where the the Supreme Court struck down a New York State law which limited the hours of bakers to uh, ten hours a day, uh, that sounds like humanitarian legislation, but it was actually pushed by an, by special interest groups, namely the bigger the bigger uh, union dominated bakers that uh, didn't have shifts that were ten hours. The smaller bakers would bring in their uh, their bakers who would put in. Uh, bread, you know, at the beginning of the evening, and then go to sleep on the premises, and then wake up and take the bread out of the... So they were there longer than 10 hours, so they weren't really working 10 hours right. uh, or more, but they were on the premises. And, and so it was an attempt of the big bakers to strike down these independent bakers who, uh, uh, who needed that flexibility. And um, the Supreme Court struck down, famously struck down that, uh, that law, but liber there would be libertarians today, Stephen Kinsella, I think, is an example, who would say the Supreme Court should not have done that. That was bad. Even though it's a bad law, the Supreme Court, it was a state law, and the Supreme Court should not have struck down that state law. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll shut up now for a little while. <laughs> As usual, there's a bunch of avenues to take in response, and I'm kind of mulling for which one. Mm -hmm. So the Kinsella argument is that the Supreme Court should simply not hear any case 
that challenges a state or local law? I mean, is that kind of like what it comes down to? Yeah, that seems very, very broad. Uh, and so I don't know if he would have some exception for some reason. Uh, uh, but generally, that's right. I mean, this gets to mm -hmm. whether the Bill of Rights applies to the states. Uh, right. Now, if you recall, the Bill of Rights, the original Bill of Rights, really do does seem to only apply to the Congress, right? Congress shall make no law. It, it does seem right. to apply to the Congress. But then the wrinkle, and then you have the Tenth Amendment too, which seems to protect the states. But then you have the Fourteenth Amendment, post Civil War, which would trump, no no pun intended here, would seem to trump the Tenth and the Fifth, and the and the others. Fifth, by the way, was has the takings clause, so it was relevant to uh, Kela. But the, so the Fourteenth comes later. And it says that no state shall violate the privileges and immunities of, uh, you know, the people of the United States. If you're a citizen of the of the of a state, you're a citizen of the United States, and the privileges and immunities apply. Uh, that's that, that's the phrase used. It's, it seems like an odd phrase. Notice the word rights is not there. It's privileges and immunities. Mm -hmm. But as uh, Roderick argues, the best interpretation of that, I mean, where else is there to look but the Bill of Rights? And so. He thinks a reasonable interpretation, no matter what was in the heads of the drafters of the amendment, that's not what matters. What we have to read the language and come up with the best interpretation is that it, it applies the Bill of Rights to the states, which means the Fifth Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment has the clause relevant to eminent domain. Hmm. <laughs> which way do you want to go on this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, there's so many. I don't know what to do. There's so many. Um... I mean, this like this sort of this sort of this this type of question comes up a lot. You know, when you have, say, Obama making a grand immigration executive order, and you and I are thinking, oh, this is humanitarian. This is you know not punishing people for simply crossing a border, and yet even often with with people of our ilk, there's this sort of uncomfortableness that this was a grand executive order, and I think. I've talked to Jeff uh, Tucker about this when that when that happened last year, and generally the conclusion is among people that I like best is that as awkward as it is, you know, you take the humanitarian thing, and obviously with with Kilo, you, I mean, it's such an awful it felt like such an awful decision, and it still feels like one. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the decentralization argument is a practical argument as opposed to sort of a pure principles one because mm -hmm. you know I don't think that my my local guy down the road should kick and, and look for drugs or take my land for the the, the Pfizer plant um, and it's no obvious ob I know this is so obvious but it isn't to some people I think it, it isn't to certain conservative types there's nothing less immoral about that than there is about the feds doing it there's simply the hope that, you know, the that the people far away don't have the widest domain. So if there's some tyrant down the road, either you take care of him or you do just, you know, move move a couple blocks down where uh, Sheriff Evil doesn't uh, have control. Yeah. So I mean, th this gets mixed up in the you know the the, the rhetorical thing that again you and I probably just like the states' rights. Um, question and this idea that states have rights is absurd and is, is, is very beside the point but even in states where some of our states are as big as a country like California I mean there's 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 more there's there uh, there's more opportunity for someone finding a better way than what the feds are up to that's that's just what it comes down to yeah uh, yeah you, uh, something you said Oh, about a minute before, gave, gave me something, an idea of something to say. Now I'm, I'm, I'm I've, I've lost it for some reason. Uh, oh darn. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing uh, Roderick wants to point out is if if the state, okay, what has been, okay, Kinsella can applaud the kilo, mm -hmm. right? Because it was the state, it was the federal government saying we're not going to strike down this local law. Yeah. Uh, but what's the what? So Roderick wants to ask in this case, what's the offsetting gain to liberty from this? He doesn't see any, so it's it's just all bad. 
Uh, and then he also gives the case of Raish versus uh, Ashcroft, which uh, came shortly before uh, Kilo, which are which struck down. Which what, this is related to medical marijuana in California. It, it didn't. It, the feds had arrested a woman who had terrible confluence of diseases and 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 needed marijuana for her treatment or at least for pain relief. Uh, and the feds went after her and some other people. She wasn't the only. I don't know if you remember this case. She wasn't the only defendant. And so they uh, they got they they got their case to the Supreme Court, and the and the Supreme Court sided with the federal government. Um, against the states, even though the states, the state in this case was taking a more libertarian position, right? Let these people buy marijuana, but the right. state upheld upheld uh, Ashcroft's actions. He was the attorney general, uh, you know, going after her, even though what she was doing was legal under state law. Because we could have, we could see more of this in the future, right? With uh, uh, Colorado and Washington and other states uh, turning to marijuana, not even medical marijuana, but just open, open, uh, free. Use of marijuana, and if the Republicans come in, we may see we may see more of this. Uh, so the question is, what's the gain if the if the feds were to keep their hands off? Where's the gain to liberty? We do have this sort of theoretical gain, right? Decentralization is better. Voting with your feet is better. Is cheaper. But right, that sort of uh, that seems very airy compared to the losses, which are real. Right. Right. And it's it's sort of potentially it's playing a long game, and it also there's a certain faith sometimes in the possibility of a minarchist. Well, I know Kinsella, for example, is not a minarchist. Um, the, a minarchist thing, a constitution that can actually bind hands, all these other things that, after several hundred years, <laughs> I personally am losing faith in this concept that a constitution can truly do this, and. So it's sort of a yeah. theoretical argument that I think kind of, you know, lost I've lost faith in that. And I think it, it does, all of these method arguments tend to lose the point. Like, um, I was arguing with actually Congressman Justin Amash on Twitter about his lack of support for the Iran deal. And I don't want to be one of those people who trust politicians, but he's alluded at sort of a Students for Liberty conference that he... He's more of a Rothbardian, but he believes he has to vote on his interpretation of the Constitution, not the Rothbardian in his heart. Um, mm -hmm. So his arguments to me were purely based on that kind of thing. And he even suggested that, you know, uh, the ends don't justify the means and, like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and then I'm thinking that, now I don't know for a fact that the Iran deal is the only thing that will prevent the war. And, you know, you know but if I did know this, I mean, the stakes... These, these types of stakes are so high that to, to, to go with the, you know, the Constitution and the rule of law instead, I've lost the capacity to really sympathize with that sort of argument because it doesn't end up with rights for the little guy because it hasn't. It keeps failing. And at this point, it's more and more tempting to throw the whole thing out. And I don't know. I, I have a drop of sympathy left for the kind of thing that Consuelo is saying, but it's not, it's not really radical enough. It's not really radical enough for him. From what I, you know, from from what I know of him, even though he's a bit of a crank and a faux conservative, he isn't one, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, the context is important. If we were at an earlier stage of American history, that might have made a difference. But again, going back to uh, the Roderick Long piece, he points out that there's a lot of water under the bridge. The states are little more than administrative districts of the federal government. So he thinks what happens in a case like Kilo, if it were to have gone the other way, it would have been you know one branch of a of a of a of a, of a, of a single centralized system because essentially that's what it is. One branch of it just said a, another branch can't do something. Uh, it's not as if these are really states with a recognized right to leave the union if they want to. I mean that's right. all that's all done. That's all done and decided. So. What's the most libertarian thing that can happen? Uh, uh, you know, okay, it seems to me this house would have been, I mean, we should have been hoping for that. And I don't see the gain to liberty from hoping, you know, hoping uh, that it not happen or, in fact, it not happening. I don't, I don't, I don't see. 
I mean, where's the gain? Okay, the, the, the feds didn't strike it down. Uh, did that somehow set in motion some libertarian process? I don't see it. It's no, and it sets, <laughs> it sets a, pre a precedent, of course. I mean, a federal precedent. Not, I mean, the precedent for the Supreme Court having, you know, its nose in, in local zoning and, and what have you, that was already there. Mm -hmm. All Kilo did, instead right. of, you know, it, it didn't set the precedent for the legitimacy of getting to decide at all. It simply set the precedent that, yes, of course you may take that land, you know, for a private purpose. So, I mean, that's, yeah, it's, it sounds almost like there's something there, but I, I did, these, these arguments don't work for me. Yeah. Um, they're, they're very beside the point. It's kind of the constitutionalists thinking, getting stuck in that, that is of limited use. I think that's right. I, th I think you can get caught up in that little bubble and you think you're serving the larger purpose of uh, furthering liberty, but instead all you're doing is satisfying some constitutional, what you think are constitutional requirements, and it's, there's a disconnect with liberty, but you're still acting as if it's connected. It's like being in a kiddie car that has a steering wheel but it's not connected to anything. <laughs> so, you, you know, the child thinks he's guiding the car, <laughs> but really not. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing where that, that metaphor is going. Um, yes, I tend to agree. Now, maybe we can talk about some of the, I don't know, the more, the, like, the concrete gains of, of, of decentralization. Um, okay. What, what I find <laughs> interesting about it is, like, you have, I mean, there's liberals in particular, let's, let's generalize, are very, very frightened of this argument. They think it means you're a neo-Confederate. They think it means you are perfectly fine when, you know, post-Civil War, pre-Civil Rights, Civil Rights, you had juries saying, oh, what murder of a black man, you know? This, this white guy's free to go. And that's all, like, the horror stories, they all happened. Um... Like, I'm not jazzed about the Civil War, but if you look at the uh, the reasons for secession, slavery is very high up there in the, in the yep. list. I mean, that was... <laughs> um, I mean, like, there's... There, you know, it, bad things can happen. You can have sort of a, a, the equivalent of a bad actor in these, in, these, in these systems, but people like my very radical left, um, less sympathetic to markets than a left libertarian, but, you know, he's... whatever he is... Even he, when, when we, we think we argue about so many things and like how the world works and what capitalism is or isn't, at the end of the day, he kind of wants radical decentralization like as well. It's almost like we, we finally get to the point where even though he thinks you know markets will come and attack his beautiful commune or whatever, <laughs> I mean, it, it's what it comes down to is that it, it, it gets back to, to radical decentralization. So... It almost seems like, even though this is a very loaded argument, when especially when you say states' rights or something less accurate, with some people where there's a serious disagreement, you can get down to just, we'll do this and you do that, and I don't know. Yeah, there are, there are left-wing uh, secessionists around. Uh, Vermont has had a long-term left-wing secessionist movement. Kirkpatrick Sale, the author, what's his book called? Uh, this is human scale, I think. Uh, and Scott Scott Horton uh, once had him on the program. On mm -hmm. this program, uh, that's a left wing secessionist movement. They they don't want to be. In the, I don't know how big or active it is, but they don't want to be in the in the union. But they're not libertarians, and uh, certainly not uh, like we are. They're not big on private property. It's right. Most of their concerns. Uh, so it's not exclusively a libertarian or you know. <laughs> the uh, the Neo you know, look, the, we should be sensitive to how other people understand uh, terms because they may understand them differently from how we do. Now, we, libertarians correctly don't like the term states' rights because we don't like to talk in terms of states having rights. Um, but when you say federalism, some people will hear states' rights. They think that's what you're getting at, and so they're worried and we should be sensitive to that, and we should know that there may that you know certain people may be thinking that, mm -hmm. and and either uh, you know make sure that's not what we mean, you know make sure they know that's not what we mean, or find some other way to show that you don't like the things that they don't like. Also, uh, you know, after all, look, the slaveholders and the people that uh, 
uh, the, the slaveholders sullied the word property. Right. And I don't think it's fully recovered yet, right? Because they wanted people, certain kinds of people, certain people uh, uh, included in property. And then when they defended slavery, they defended their property, didn't they? Right. So that was, a, you know, that was a terrible thing for libertarians, people who believe in, in private property but only mean by that, you know, inanimate but it seems obvious. such obvious bullshit. I don't know. That's interesting. I don't, I don't feel that property is that solid of a word. Not as solid as some other words I like. That you know, I don't know. I mean, because it seems so obvious that yes, people are not property. That's that's yeah. different. You, you geniuses. Well, it's it's faded, but I think there's still some <laughs> taint. Yeah. Taint. And then the same thing with you know local control or states' rights or any of those terms that suggest right. you know make some people remember Jim Crow. Uh, black codes, and uh, and and we need to make it clear that's not what we mean. That we think uh, to to the extent we favor decentralization is because we think liberty has a better chance for the reasons I already elaborated. Because we're optimists, somehow. yeah, and it's because it lowers the cost of leaving. As and as long as you know, we must also insist on freedom of exit. <laughs> uh, yes, no matter and that, what size the jurisdiction is, there must be freedom of exit, or else it doesn't have our blessing. I mean, that's why I don't, you know, I had an argument once with uh, Daniel McCarthy about this, and, uh, it, you know, you, you start to wonder what kind of society, a you know, potentially very rigid and authoritarian society, if it were voluntary and there was always the right to exit, like, could we sort of tolerate? And I am honestly not sure. I think with children, you know, you get more into the... Dodgy type things because children aren't really free to exit, um, both because they don't have that right and because biologically, you know, if they're a toddler in a in a horrible environment, they they have no options, you know. Um, but like the, the like the, we have to one. I wonder as libertarians, like, does it come does it come down to purely, you know, all you thirty people can have as rigid and cult-like a society as you like. You're all adults for manners of convenience. <laughs> and you all, you know, can leave whenever. And, and there's certainly a type who says that's all. Libertarians have nothing to say about that. Um, and, in, you know, in, a, in our radical decentralized society that we're theorizing, that might very well come up. And well, I don't know. I don't know. Now we're back, we're back into a subject that you... Uh, Competently moderated uh, between uh, in a, <laughs> between me and and uh, Wolfer Block about uh, well he didn't want to talk about uh, he did want to talk about fiscal libertarianism even though that wasn't the topic that's right yes uh, <laughs> so because that's you're now raising that issue I mean what if we saw a commune rising in either a free society or or even one we're just aspiring to you know make free uh, where people uh, you know, blindly worship. It's to, it's totally voluntary, right? No one's been right. held by gunpoint. Uh, they but the children have been brought up in it, so they're of course inundated with it as they're growing. Uh, and they and they have there's this cult figure that they regard as all knowing. He never uses force. It's not right. like one of these TV shows where the cult leader is actually using force, or even in real, in real life, like uh, what was the guy? Jones, the guy Jonestown, the guy in Jonestown. Uh, I have a feeling he wasn't. Well, totally, he, he wasn't he used totally force at the end. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, so now the Finn libertarian Walter Block would say, and I have no fear that he will contradict me. <laughs> you can back me up on this. He will say that's not a libertarian concern. We have nothing to say about it as libertarians. He say I, I may comment about it as a as not as a something else, <laughs> as a human right. being that I don't find it attractive, that kind of community, and I wouldn't want to live there. Uh, but I would say, and uh, the people who I identify as, le as uh, not, not necessarily left libertarians, although it is related to left libertarianism, mm -hmm. but as particular, in particular here, thick libertarian, no, as a libertarian, we can be appalled by that. Uh, that doesn't mean we can use force to stop it. Of course, that doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. uh, unless they're actually using force, then somebody can go to the defense of innocent people. But let's just say, let's say by hypothesis they're 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 not using force, uh, but we would still be concerned qua libertarians. 
what you do about it is going to be very dependent on the exact context. You know, I, I would need, you need to know a lot more details what you can do. Maybe you're just going to pick it and say and try to get people to listen to you know leave the commune. This is not the way to live as a human being. Leave this place. Don't worship this cult person. I mean, again, what you do depends exactly on the context. But what doesn't depend on the context is the the libertarian could could be concerned about this, even though there's right. no coercion being used, no physical force or fraud. Right, because be I mean, any you know any sort of defense contractor, there's always the theory that they'll you know they could turn into a state someday. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that, like, I'm somewhere strangely in the middle between thick and thin libertarians, I think. Um, I'm a chubby libertarian, shall we say. Um, but, I mean, there's a point where, like, I, I do agree with you. I think that there's libertarianism as a basic summation is concerned with, you know, the state and coercion and stuff. But there, there are certain atmospheres that are so close to being coercive, even if they're sort of not officially coercive if you don't, you know, you don't have that, that monopoly on force that sometimes it's not just category A or B, you know, free or coercive. There's some mm. community settings and some family settings that it's hard not to describe as authoritarian. It's very tangential, but it, it does interest me. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but if we, let's see, if we, I had a point back at our original point. Um, I'm not feeling very... Uh, fast on my feet today, <laughs> or my brain, fast on my brain. Um, almost there. So I was there. Something about the Ninth Amendment, something about conservatives. <laughs> I uh, can't find it. I can't find my point. I lost unenumerated it. Unenumerated rights in the Ninth Amendment or the Tenth Amendment? Um, Lord, I had a thing. I, 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 I had a query. All right, okay, well, one point. One, I, don't, I don't know I don't know if I'm just rehashing this. But I, I, I get this argument with people where you talk about, uh, sometimes it's nice people who are fairly anti-war even or would like to avoid it at all costs. And I make this argument too in cert certain contexts. You talk about an illegal war as opposed to a legal war. But to me, you know, like making a, a war voted on by Congress, all of the, sort of the proper procedures, that is just an attempt to put up a roadblock between a war. It's not saying that that war is any more legitimate or should happen more than a executive branch, you know, undeclared war. At the yeah. end of the day, if, if the exact same number of people are dying, it's just as bad. It's simply, you know, you're using the system to try to throw something in front of the tanks. Now, I, I, I find that similar to, the, again, the decentralization thing where you, again, it's not any more moral. You just have a better shot of more options. But I, I have encountered people who seem very, com and libertarians even, of the, of the moderate sort, who are very comfortable with a drug war at the states. I mean, I heard Bob Barr talk about this. You know, it's like it's a state matter. Ron Paul at his sort of wishy-washiest um, would say, well, it's a state matter, it's a state matter. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes and no. It's Perhaps that would be an improvement, but a state can do appalling things. What we have now is states having the federal government encouraging them to have the worst laws. We have the worst of both worlds right now, of course. No, I, I agree. I mean, there is this uh, principle, I think it comes out of Catholicism, of subsidia subsidiarity, I think, is, is, where you start with the most local level, and if that doesn't work, you go out. You know, If that doesn't work, you go further out. I mean, that's the principle. And, and so you've seen libertarians and conservatives and I, and I guess some cases uh, uh, leftists like Kirkpatrick Sale um, be inclined to that idea that you you don't go to any higher level than you than you need to go to a higher level of government but I, I kind of agree with you it's not so much a principle first look first of all if, if you're uh, for a stateless society then then you don't want to state at the local level the state level or the federal level or the, or the international level uh, the national, I don't like to say federal level, that already seems to suppose the system, right? The national level or international level. Uh, so we're already sort of talking at the basis, uh, at, at the level of strategy, not so right. much the principle, right. but, you know, what's what's most likely to throw up roadblocks, because the term used is a good one regarding the war power. What, what's, yeah, what's going to 
cause the people that want to expand or do bad things, do unlibertarian things, uh, cause them to trip and and and, not, and and fail to gain their objective. So that makes it seem less than the we're not quite in the realm of pure principle now, and that may give us more flexibility in saying, you know, if they had struck down Kilo. I mean, if Kilo had gone the other way, we, you know, I don't see why a libertarian couldn't, you know, without hesitation, applaud. I'm that used this to. Woman, this woman could keep her house. Yes. That she was born in. I believe she was born in that house. And she was, a, you know, she was an older woman by the time they took it. So this was a house she wanted to die in, presumably. And, and they, of course, how can we not build, applaud? They didn't build their fucking Pfizer plant, of course. They just turned it into, I believe, a literal garbage heap. And yet they took her house because that's how lovely the state is, of course. And Pole Town, I'm not sure they ever built a Cadillac plant for a while. It was a parking lot. I don't know if they ever got around to building a building it anyway. That's but great. that's right. So how can we say, <laughs> "Yay, the government right. didn't stand in the way of taking you know, <laughs> block block the bulldozers"? I, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't have been comfortable doing that. <laughs> another like larger um, question. And I suppose we should get to we should get to question from our audience eventually. But yes, another sort of libertarian uh, concern I have or question is when when it's more directly the feds butting in. And the civil rights era is sort of a good example of that. I mean, do you ever applaud federal troops or sort of the the Weasley way that um, the feds sometimes got people on? On federal civil rights violations, when 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 a jury had you know let, I believe, the people who killed those three civil rights workers, um, yeah. and basically they got away with that. Situations like that where where, I think LBJ um, sort of finagled it so that these people got a couple of years in prison, not murder sentences, but for violations of these people's civil rights. And when it's that. Just the feds writing in, you know, you have the, I don't know, the 101st Airborne and, like, desegregating the schools and stuff. That's mm -hmm. a big libertarian box that we don't even have time to get into, but I don't know if you can, if you have anything, um, a little brief on that. I think that's harder than the Kilo thing. Yeah. I think the Kilo thing, I obviously yeah. say, of course that was horrible. That's that's right. And so you raise a good, I mean, because it's... It's a, it's tough. Um, you know, it's good that you raised it. Um, it. It's good to raise stuff that makes us uncomfortable, because it means we're not ducking the tougher issues. We live in a we live in a messy world because of uh, not I won't I won't say mainly there might be a lot of messiness anyway, but but in a great measure because of states because states exist. So so uh, yes, federal troops were sent. I mean, during the in the fifties and early sixties into states because state governments and local governments and police who were also, you know, clans members, clan right. members at the same time were doing terrible things to people. Uh, people were getting away with lynching. Uh, you know, H.L. Mencken, who uh, called himself an extreme libertarian, he wasn't, you know, uh, uh, he wasn't, uh, I wouldn't call him, you know, a perfect libertarian. He, w he wasn't that yeah, careful he was about he wasn't a, he didn't really like ideology and doctrine but his certainly his uh, spirit and uh, and uh, lots of his concrete positions were pro liberty. I mean he favor, certainly was in favor of liberty. He supported a federal he hated FDR. Favor the federal anti lynching law that was proposed that by the way uh, Roosevelt opposed mm -hmm. because Roosevelt didn't want to alienate you know racists in the Democratic Party. But M Mencken was appalled that people were getting away with lynching. Right. And and it wasn't, you couldn't count on the, the states weren't going to do anything about it. I mean, certainly the southern states weren't going to. He was in Maryland, and I think there was, you know, that, that was considered a southern state. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, yeah, you have a case of uh, egregious uh, injustice against uh, people, and uh, a, a national administration sends the National Guard or sends troops, you know, like Eisenhower did. What do you what do you say about it? Um, I know that really bothered libertarian types in those days. I I, I was a little too young to be speaking out <laughs> in yes. the fifties. In the fifties, uh, so I so I uh, I can't I can, my record can't be raised against me because I wasn't <laughs> saying I wasn't saying anything. 
But it, it would have been really difficult. I, w I would have had a hard time siding with, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have been enthusiastic about the national troops being sent into a state. On the other hand, I also don't want to, I wasn't going to be taking the side of, uh, of, of racists in the states right. who were doing rotten things to innocent people. Uh, it's it's okay to acknowledge like the the contradictions in how I mean in particular there's a there's some very loaded eras of, of recent history and for libertarians in particular the civil rights era is like it, we haven't untangled it yet in, in the laws that came into effect and just how completely mixed they were mm. and it's okay I think that we're not like we don't have this all conveniently figured out. Certainly when there's a legal precedent that you're dealing with, it can be, um, or a power precedent, more, more, more to the point, you know. Like that's, mm -hmm. to be more careful with that. One thing I don't think we need to do is to have any type of consistent principle that, 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 that sort of props up the state. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of, of Kim Davis, you know, the, that pain in the ass woman um, who's <laughs> gotten so much media attention. Glad you mentioned her. I saw a lot of conservatives actually being against her because they are so, you know, concerned with the rule of law that they say, well, I mean, like, we're against her, but, like, you, you know, you John liberals were for Gavin Newsom, the mayor of San Francisco, when, you know, in 2004 he started marrying gay people when he wasn't legally allowed to. And they act as if that's the same thing. Yeah. And... I don't think it is. It's, and, and they act as if any law breaking, any not doing your job, your legal job, is somehow morally equal. And one thing that I would like to say is that libertarians should never fall into that trap because that is, the, that is acknowledging the state as some sort of higher legitimacy instead of what did that do? You know, did you deprive someone of something? Did you give someone something you shouldn't be giving them? I mean, what did it do to the individual? At the end of the day, that's what we should care about while acknowledging the dangers of certain precedents and certain powers above powers and you know, I just there's an all these arguments tend to just sort of acknowledge the state in this way that I, I think is oh, completely harmful yeah if, if two governments in, in, the, in the case of the United States I guess this would be levels of government are in conflict with each other and liberty is in the in, you know in the crossfire I think we side with liberty, right? Uh, even if that means, in a given case, it's the national government that we're we're, we're on the side of the national national government because in that particular case, it's defending liberty against you know, an oppressive local or state government. I mean, I I don't see how I could, in good conscience, do otherwise. Uh, the only objection would be a Kinsella type inject, uh, objection that we should always side with, we should always take the side of decentralism, but. But the individual argument, perhaps that is the ultimate side of decentralization, is to always be on the individual side. Whatever side is not coercing someone, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Decentralization is is instrumental, right? It's not an end in itself. Like you, you were saying. Right. Exactly. Earlier. Exactly. Thank so, you. Yes. so how can we how can we blindly deontologically uh, support decentralization when we have in front of us a person who's being trashed by a local or state government? And where the federal government is taking a position on behalf of the that individual, right. so uh, yeah, that does seem to clear it up. On the the Gavin Newsom thing is interesting because why is it different from? I mean, I would applaud Gavin Newsom, right? I mean, I did at the time, sure. Yeah, because he he was recognizing rights, unlike this woman. He didn't have a he didn't have a court ruling on his side. Right. Uh, it was. Civil disobedience, rather, it's on his part. Interpreting the law in the, in the libertarian way, I would right. say. And we, it was certainly, we had a whole argument about, same uh, discussion about same-sex marriage and how it's obviously not ideal to have it. Yeah. A government, you know, granted rights and privileges, but for gay people to claim this right is a sort of self-defense. You can have a situation where your partners could be deported, can't see yeah. them in hospitals. I mean, we've, we've all heard those a million times, but it really does happen to people. So yeah. I can never, you know, I mean, so Gavin Newsom was, they were both, you know, they were both not following the law. They were not doing their jobs properly in those cases, but he was doing a bit of civil disobedience and acknowledging a right that should have been there. And she's just, you know, whining about, 
a right that someone else decided was there. I don't know. It's just, I just, I think we should just fundamentally reject this idea that we cannot look at the people involved. We just have to look at the law says this, and that's all. And that's why would a libertarian, right. even a slightly libertarian right. person, take that at all? It's, it's just well, we're all, law we're all in favor of uh, uh, you know defying or not obeying uh, unjust orders. That that would violate people's rights, like a soldier being told to go into a village and just you know shoot anything that moves. Right. Uh, uh, so it's not that we're. I mean, my point about Davis was not the law says you know X Y Z, so she she should do that no matter what. Right. I'm interested in the content. If she right, that's... If, if the law was ordering her to do something that violated rights, I would be applauding her. Right. And this idea that we can't look at that is a, is a conservative argument. It's not a libertarian one, as much as some libertarians do make it. Right. So, yeah, I, I've taken fleck from some libertarians on the whole same-sex marriage thing, even before uh, Davis, but then it came up again because, you know, because when you're married, that gives you access to some coercive uh, government programs, let's say, like paid family leave or even just mandated unpaid family leave. But that's right. incidental to the marriage license. That was added on by you know legislatures or Congress later on. So to condemn, say, same-sex couples for wanting a marriage license because this now enables them to compel an employer, there's no right. reason to condemn same-sex marriage as long as the government is involved in marriage. Condemn, go fight the additional add-on legislation. Right. Sure. That gives you access to uh, employer benefits against their will. But some people want to use that to condemn the marriage license per se. Our case against the marriage license is not that you can get unpaid leave or you can get paid leave from your employer. It's, it's, more, it's deeper than that. And you can, marriage, you can imagine state marriage licenses. Obviously, you can. That don't have all those other add-ons. That, that wouldn't make the marriage government... That wouldn't make government involved in, in marriage correct. But it wouldn't have that. You couldn't make that objection that you know leave is then available or whatever other things people complain about. There's some people on Facebook that constantly go after me about this that I'm somehow in favor of all those coercive things, and that's not the point. The point is they're just they were just added on later. You know they were added on by legislators after the fact. A very silly libertarian thing is sometimes this purity thing where every government action is just as bad as the other one. Because they're all fundamentally coercive, you know, and against mm -hmm. anarchistic principles. And in the day, sure, it's all coercive. I'll give you that. But then, that's that's just sort of a that's just a very foolish concept to act as if you know, the benevolent um, welfare state and sort of the, the 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 clunky charitable things that don't work and are still coercive. You still, I mean, war is worse than that, you know? I mean, like, you, the idea that they're all, all government things must be equally bad just because the government is bad is a very odd argument that I encounter. Right, yeah, uh, that's right. Um, and, you know, a general equality of treatment was part of the liberal program from the very beginning, the liberal right. class of the libertarian. Right. Uh, but we need to draw a distinction because it doesn't mean that if there's conscription of men, we should be demanding conscription of women because of, uh, we favor equality under the law. <laughs> right, right. And so we got to we got to word it carefully, and it doesn't leave us open to that. What we demand is repeal of conscription <laughs> of men. Of course, <laughs> uh, because that's wrong in itself. Not be, not only because or maybe not because women aren't drafted. That's not why because, the draft because is because bad. Because it's inherently <laughs> bad. Right. Because if women were being drafted, then we we would be saying the same thing. Repeal it. Right. So um, look, yeah, look, the stuff is messy. The stuff gets complicated, but that doesn't relieve libertarians of the responsibility to thread these needles and you know split the hairs where they need to be split. Right. Definitely. We care about liberty, not these formalities. Yes. Quite. Um, let's see if we have any promising questions before we wrap yes, this thing audience. up. We have a bit of a serious. This one is very. Um, this is a, this is a lot for the next seven minutes. But Christopher okay. Hudson is wondering. This sort of reminds. I'm not sure what this is, is specifically. Maybe he can tell us. Reminds 
We have insurrectionary anarchist arguments for violent tactics against the state and its economic supporters and beneficiaries. <laughs> Would you, in some circumstances, support tactics like economic saboteur <laughs> that technically violate uh, private property but are done to promote individual liberty? Damn, Christopher, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know if we should, you know, answer in any specific way on the internet, you know, for all to see, just in case. <laughs> yeah, because you may say so, you may <laughs> seem to approve something and that might happen independently, and then you're implicated. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure one how thing to that complicates it. it is that nominally private companies aren't fully private, like military contractors. Right. right. What if uh, what if a company's making drones which are being used to uh, to kill people in Somalia and uh, Pakistan, Yemen, uh, <laughs> and then it gets <laughs> very... I'm not, I'm not urging anybody to go out and do that, but as an academic matter, uh, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. You'll know what I mean by interesting. That's a very interesting question. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> the a, NSA cares about academic. Yeah, I, don't. <laughs> I don't know, though. Hey, I, I... there is the First Amendment. Don't I have free speech? <laughs> Um, I, I've had a many suspicious phone conversations in particular. I'm always talking to either Eric Garris or my, my crazy cousin in, in California, and just it's like I'm trying to get the NSA to listen to me with the, the you know theoretical academic discussions I have. I probably shouldn't, but it might be too late now. Um, all right. Oh, here we go. Tom. That's right. Thank you, Tom. You said this way back up there. All right. He asked, the Fifth Amendment seems to clearly state that the government can take private land for public use with just compensation. Are you opposed to eminent domain in all circumstances? Uh, yeah, uh, this actually is covered in, in, in the very way I have written about it before by, by Roderick in that paper, in that article. Uh, yeah, th this leads to an interesting, the interesting subject of constitutional interpretation or, or textual interpretation. Uh, so the framers said, or whoever wrote the Fifth Amendment says, uh, private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. Right. Now I've long argued, and and I'm I was glad and I, I was glad to see Roderick uh, saying the same thing that um, if if we take if we interpret that in in what I regard as a reasonable way to interpret that clause, then that rules out all eminent domain. Because part of the idea of just compensation is that it's accepted voluntarily by the person, right, who's who's offered to. Uh, yeah. I can't take something from you at gunpoint, give you some money, and saying this is what I think is just compensation. You know, see, <laughs> that's not just compensation. That so, is very true. <laughs> now, on the other hand, some people will say yes, but of course they wouldn't have written an amendment that subverted itself or or a clause. That would have subverted itself. If they were against eminent domain, they would have not had said anything, or they would have had a prohibition. But they wouldn't have played a verbal game, right? They said you can have eminent domain, but you have to have just compensation. But just compensation is only when it's a voluntary exchange, <laughs> so therefore you can't have eminent domain. <laughs> they wouldn't have played games like that. But uh, but I'm a like Roderick. I'm a Spoonerian. Mm -hmm. That means uh, an advocate of uh, Lysander Spooner's method of interpreting the Constitution and legal language. It's not what was in the minds of the framers, the guys that wrote it down on parchment, but what a what it those words actually mean. Look, when they said other persons, they meant slaves, but they right. didn't write slaves. And as Spooner said in his Unconstitutionality of Slavery, in his book by that title. He said we are entitled to come up with a, a reasonable interpretation of what other persons means. That was not a euphemism generally for slavery. Right. It was just they didn't want to say the word slave. So they said three-fifths of uh, you know, other persons. Well, that's... We have, we're allowed to give it a pro-liberty uh, interpretation. That's... We're not bound by what we knew was in their heads. They didn't put it down. That's a fundamentally li legal argument. It's simply using the law to destroy itself. But law is all about, you know, usually it's squeezing a greater right to the state out of a couple of word choices, at least it frequently is. So to use law and its vagaries against itself is fantastic. Now, yeah. Yeah. You, you, get a, you get a liberals with a living constitution who somehow managed to make 
you know, the Constitution for all its flaws worse. Like, that is a danger, but again, like, the libertarian should be, like, these should all be methods to get to individual rights. You shouldn't be bogged down in, you know, the Constitution. You should be using the Constitution to get past the Constitution to actual spoonery goodness. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, and Roderick says in, in the article that Stefan, he's, he's discussed this with Stefan Kinsella, and Kinsella said, well, they probably had in mind something like, you know, fair market value or right, sure. prevail, prevailing market value, but they didn't say it. Just compensation doesn't mean prevailing market value. That's There's not a... I mean, property has so much subjective, perhaps sentimental value. Like um, Kilo, Susan, K Suzanne yep. Kilo herself, if that was her house since she was a child, and she was—I mean, I don't remember the details, yep. but there's so much. Right. And and if it's never, if there's an amount that's never going to be enough to make up for the fact that you lived in this house since you were five, then it ain't just compensation. I mean, you know. Right, right. They said just, so we're entitled <laughs> using the Spooner's uh, principles. We're in, and, and even if the framers thought they met, thought that what was happening with eminent domain in their day was just, we know better, and therefore we can use that to invalidate any eminent domain. I, I concur. Just. If they were mistaken about what justice requ uh, requires, then tough luck for them. First of all, they're dead. <laughs> right. There is that. We're not we're not stuck with their mistaken no this is this is a point that Paine makes too, Thomas Paine, about being ruled by the dead hand of the past. Right? If they were mistaken in what they what they understood, let's say it was very honest, in what they understood that justice required, if they were mistaken and we know better, then we go with what we know, not with their mistaken we can't be ruled by their mistaken uh, concept of justice or application of justice. That would right. be ridiculous. Or we, I mean, we would still be tolerating slavery at that point if that, if, if you know, yeah. if they had it all down perfectly. So eminent domain is theft. I don't see any two ways about it, and uh, the people who love Trump ought to be reminded of that, or thought, <laughs> or thought that, because he's he loves eminent domain. He's taken land from old ladies, by the way. At least in one case in Atlantic City, he took a house, who that stood in the way of his casino. Yeah. So. I don't know why the uh, Tea Party types aren't being told that their hero uh, take, takes not candy from babies, but homes from old ladies, which may be worse. They're not interested in the specifics. They're truly not. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I see it's 601. Uh, for you, it is. Uh, in the oh, real okay, world on the East Coast, it's uh, <laughs> 901. Well, All that right. doesn't really change. The, it's one minute after, Let's put it this way. It's one minute after the hour. That's what counts. All right, so... Um, oh, you're supposed to remind... Uh, yes, do you have the commercial to give? I forgot. I, I, I guess Julie Borowski is going to talk to Austin Peterson or vice versa at this moment. Um, so that's a thing to watch. Here's a... Hold on, here's a link to that. If you crazy kids want to go check that out. Um, we also have on Thursday, our friend Mike Reed, who is a very good egg, is going to talk to... Tracy Lawson, who has a book, I believe it's a fiction book that sounds all dystopian, um, and that's that's sort of intriguing. So I will give the good people that link if they want to check that out. Um, yeah, go read Sheldon's stuff. Go read his blog. Give him money at his blog. Um, <laughs> read Lucy and Annie War and wherever else she is. I'll try to do a vice thing this week. I, I need to write more words and you know, waffle less. We covered many, many things, and never many, and we'll get this liberty thing figured out soon, guys. Like between Sheldon and I, I think we should both we should be able to get it down. So absolutely, we'll be we'll be here uh, uh, two weeks from tonight. All uh, right, join us again. Send Thank send you. us t send us topic ideas if you if you have any. Yes, that's a good one. <laughs> think up questions beforehand so we know we're so we're ready for you. Yes, all all that. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you, Liberty.me. See you next time. Bye-bye.